But first, like I said, Florida's primary election is Tuesday, tomorrow, August 20th. Here with that preview of what voters can expect on Election Day is Jerry from the Beaches. Excuse me, Jerry Holland, our election supervisor. Good morning, Jerry. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate being here. You know, he, he and I go back a long way back when he was a city council member. And so uh, uh, on air, I want to say you've always been uh, easy to deal with and always answer questions. So thank you for that. So now we have some more questions for you. Uh, tomorrow is a big day across the state. And as we've been discussing before the show, uh, is the supervisor of elections office, are the precincts ready? Precincts are ready. And, and what's nice is also we encourage our poll workers tonight to go set up the locations. They won't open the tabulators or anything that's sealed when it comes to the voting uh, tabulation. But they'll go tonight, set it up. And, you know, if you've never been a poll worker, those who are listening that are, they're very excited about elections. You know, they they love getting there. It's the camaraderie of the group and the the fellowship and the helping voters. So it's a it's a fun day for them. And what are the biggest questions that you're getting? Like what today when you go to the office, uh, that phone's going to ring, the, the email's going to buzz. What are the biggest questions coming to you from potential voters or those who've already voted early? Well, most of the questions today, the day prior to election is, where do I vote? You know, where is my precinct at? Uh, you can go online, duvallelections.gov, and there's actually a precinct finder, which you put in your name and address, and it'll tell you where. Or you can call us at uh, 255-VOTE, and we'll, we'll look up the location for you. We want to make sure you find that location. Now, we'll say a lot of the polling locations have changed. We had a lawsuit last year before coming into office. And it, it caused us to have to reduce our precincts because we had too many in some areas and too few in other areas. And so for a lot of people, we think somewhere around 225,000 voters, your polling location or your polling number has changed. So hopefully you still have that mailer that came to you. That, that sample ballot is so valuable. It shows your location. It tells you who's going to be on your ballot. It's something you, you should always bring to the polls when you come to vote. You know, I've got you here. This I can't, I can't pass this one up. For years, to get to my voting precinct, I drive by two others, one of which used to be my precinct. It seems odd that my precinct must be snaking through some portion of the south side to get to where my correct precinct is, but I'm passing by two others. Why? It's not unusual because what will happen is, let's say yours is on one side of the road and the other two are on the other side. The other two may actually be right at a split. Sometimes it's a split of a city council district. Sometimes we'll put all the same house seat in one precinct versus the other. We try to eliminate those splits. Uh, but so often it's the way they're drawn. It's the geographic location of the city council districts. But we do get that. You know, voters go, why can't I go to that one? It's across the street from my house, <laughs> and I've got to go a mile down here to another one. It has to do a lot with what's on your ballot and, again, uh, where the city council district lines are. Uh, for me as a journalist, though, plus there's a fourth one across Beach Boulevard, it allows me to see how voting is going just by eyeballing it and at four precincts. So at least I can get an idea of what at least my neck of the woods is getting now. Tomorrow, of course, people go in, they do the touch screen or they do the, the paper ballot. But what about early voting? Uh, how did that go? Well, we had about 30 percent of our voters participate in early voting. You know, somewhere around, I would say, close to 45,000 voters went to early voting sites, um, which is, again, we'd like to see that number greater. Uh, we'd like to, you know, we like the fact that about 30 percent of our voters are voting early. Where we're not getting people voting where they used to is by mail. Only about 20% of our voters vote by mail now. It used to be about 30%. So it's dropped off, and in some cases, even more than that. So, But early voting, again, we opened up new sites. Uh, we used to have only 19. We now have 24. So we really tried to be throughout the community in more locations. So why has it dropped off? I mean, I'm thinking... Okay, maybe we're modern. We want to email things and not mail things with a stamp. But why Why did that? The, the you think the drop-off? Well, a little bit of it is it's the 2020 election. Uh, some, there was such a spike in the 2020 election for vote by mail because of COVID. It was a safe way to vote. Um, and after that, there was a drop-off. And also, one of the political parties really discouraged people from voting by mail. Now, they've 
trying to tell their voters, go out there and vote by mail. But that was a turn down. you got to look at 2020, we had over 120,000 voters vote by mail. In this election here, we've only had 60,000 requests, half the number of what we had four years ago. Voter turnout. Been pretty high of late. A lot of a lot of TV ad time. A lot of people getting yelled at by candidates and PACs. So what is the prediction for turnout? People walking in tomorrow. We should still see about 50 percent of those who are going to vote will go to the polls tomorrow. Uh, however, that's a still a small amount of people who actually will be going. We'll have, probably have somewhere around 75,000 of our voters in Duval County. Mind you, we have 630,000 voters in Duval County. About 75,000 will go to the polls tomorrow. That'll take our overall turnout tomorrow at the end of the day, probably around 23% turnout for this primary. It, it sometimes amazes me, maybe again, being a journalist and, and watching things with a different eye. There's so much seemingly so much public involvement out there in the national and state races. Um, You'd think there'd be, silly me, you'd think there'd be some fire in the belly of the voter to get out there and have their say. Well, some of it's misconceptions uh, in that a lot of people say, oh, it's the primary. I'll get to vote for these races in November. Not always true. Some of these school board races will be over in August. Uh, Judicial races will be over, some of them, in August. So from the reality is, yeah, if you want to be involved in all of government, you need to vote in all elections. And if you go to a precinct tomorrow, even if it's busy, you should be in and out in 10 minutes, right? Maybe the longest period, maybe parking. Yes. And and really, tomorrow, there there won't be, I, I don't anticipate any lines tomorrow. Uh, you know, it will be a pretty smooth day. Now, come November. If you're going to wait to election day to vote, Dan, I know you like to wait to election day. Expect to be in lines because, again, if we have 50 percent of the voters and now we're talking somewhere around 300,000 voters, you know, going out to the polls to 160 locations on election day, there will be lines. I encourage people, please vote early or vote by mail for November. You know, I've been known to stand in line, shoot a photo outside and post it on social to show as a news note. Here's what it's like at my precinct, not inside, of course, but outside. Um, So that doesn't bother me. That's part of the process. And uh, um, I've been called to jury duty now, so it doesn't bother me either. Uh, To to the old wives tale that uh, if you if you vote, by golly, your name's on that list. Um, So early voting starts in Duval as of. Today, right? Early voting ended yesterday. yesterday. Um, Let's see. What can you expect tomorrow at 7 o'clock at these precincts? Well, at 7 o'clock, uh, we'll get them open. And, and that's our, our first goal of the day is to make sure every polling location opens on time, which is 7 o'clock. So that's why those poll workers will arrive at least an hour early, setting up the equipment, making sure every works. We're there in our command center and call center at the election center over on Imason, looking, we can see automatically if the events, the electronic voter check-ins have set up and been ready and everything's ready to go, we can monitor that. We have rovers that are going throughout the uh, city looking at different precincts if they have any problems setting up. But that big initial goal is everything opens at 7. And we will have some people waiting there at 7, and I love that, that they're waiting for the doors to open. Don't forget, you can give us a call here at First Coast Connect at 904-549-2937. We welcome your calls, and we have Mark from the West Side with a question. Good morning, Mark. You're on the air. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Michelle, I appreciate you being here. Um, I want to know how we can take votes of really big-ticket items. Well, I'm not going to say that. How can we take future votes of the Jaguars where we're talking about hundreds, hundreds of taxpayer money out of the hands of the city council and put them in the hands of the citizens for a vote. And I'm specifically talking about this last, you know, these guys, I don't think there was a majority of city council people were all hot about the city council, about the uh, deal with the Jaguars. I think they just wanted to not be the guy that sent the Jaguars packing. And also a lot of people don't know this when they voted for this uh, deal with the Jaguars, each 
council district got a hundred, got a million dollars to spend as he wished. Now, if that's not a bribe, I don't know what is. So, I think that if we had, uh, if we can somehow return that vote or put that vote in the hands of the citizens, we would have had a whole different outcome, and which they clearly didn't want to do. But how, how can we do that? What's a way we can do that aside from me going out to a hundred million? Uh, yeah, 100,000 voters with a petition. I mean, is there any other way to do that? Okay, thanks, Mark. Well, you know, that obviously means that someone has to put a ballot question. Yeah, and, and when it comes to that, you you really need to set it up ahead of time. You're right. Uh, the city council could have said, hey, listen, this is too big of an issue. Let's see what the voters want. And they could have put it on the ballot. But for citizens to put it on the ballot, you really first maybe want to set the bar. Like if the council ever has something in front of them that is going to affect the public in such a way that it's going to be over a half of a half of a billion dollars, it should go to a referendum. So you could set it up within our charter to do that, but a citizen referendum or a council referendum would have to set that bar to make it a ballot initiative every time. And you're right. A lot of times council members don't want to, you know, be on the on the hook for doing something like that. And uh, but it it's not a uh, a bad thought to say when we're looking at something that's a half a billion dollars, should we get our a, a buy-in from our voters? You know, even if it's not binding, even if it's a resolution, at least the council would say, you know, this is what the public wants, and I'm representative of the public. So you could do it as a a resolution, or you could do it as an ordinance, but you have to set that bar with some kind of citizen initiative. Uh, ahead of time so that that would always trigger that vote in the future. We're getting some social media comment. Andrew emailed from working the early voting poll. I've noticed a discomforting trend. Far too many voters distrust the express vote option. The common complaint is that it is electronic voting and also that some kind of chicanery takes place inside the machine once their ballot goes in. It would go a long way to dispel the disinformation if you could address that issue. Well, you know, it's interesting. It comes to the point, you know, someone asked me, what's the difference when I came into elections in 2005 and when I came back now in 2023? In 2005, we were kind of uh, kind of lingering from the, from the hangover of the chads, and everyone embraced technology. Everyone knew that that was a, uh, a, a kind of archaic way of voting with the chads, non-electronic, you know, didn't have any electronics to it. But it, it, it was inaccurate. So we embrace technology. Today, it's the opposite. We don't want technology, according to some voters. We want to go back to a manual system of voting. And some actually states and some communities have actually had referendums to go back to a paper, a pure analog system. Yes. Yeah. But mind you this, in the state of Florida, every vote is cast on a paper ballot. Even when we talk about the express vote, which is really a mechanical device that fills out your ballot and shows your selections on the ballot before you put it in the tabulator. But from that standpoint, you are still got a paper ballot and you can still see what it's going to vote on. So again, it's again, there's a distrust in equipment, but from reality, go back just 24 years and we didn't have any electronics in it. And we had an election that was truly in chaos because of the lack of technology. You, you go one way or the other. You know, we actually did receive a complaint uh, from a voter over the weekend regarding the, the touch screen and issues. Um, and again, just like your cell phone, if you've got calluses, sometimes it doesn't respond. So, and you're aware of this. So what was that issue? Well, that particular issue was on the express vote and the voter had used the express vote. And mind you this, you do not have to use the express vote. It is an option in early voting. You can request an optical scan ballot, and that's no problem whatsoever, and fill in your ovals with a pen. This gentleman used an express vote. The express vote is done by a touch of your hand. Now, sometimes, and we're all experienced, this even on our phones, is if your hands are cold or you got a callus or something, it won't register. So he made his votes in certain votes, and they came through. But as he did another one, he thought he had voted for two candidates, And when he printed the card, they weren't on there. Now, the mistake we made, and I say we because it's my election's office, the poll worker, when he brought it to their attention, said, oh, you've already voted because he was trying to put it back in the machine. No, you can't put that same card back in the machine. But what they should have done is spoil that ballot, 
give them an opportunity to either vote and fill in as ovals or go back to the express vote and do another one from start. They didn't do that. So I advised him. He went back and voted provisional for the races. He did not vote in the first try. You know, we're talking about problems. I can remember that there have been issues with a machine or machines at some polls. Some polls open late because of a power issue, I seem to remember. What are some of the common mistakes that you're ready to pack up a van and go head out to a precinct to fix? Well, typically, um, one of the, the mistake or mistakes or common things that can happen is uh, the machine is not connected to the internet, the tabulator, but the EVIDs, which are the electronic voter check-in, are. And the reason they're connected is as soon as the voter votes, we want to make sure that voter can't vote again. And it's also to make sure that if they had a vote by mail ballot and it came in, that they can't vote a ballot there at the polls. If they deny that they voted it, they can vote provisional. But so from a standpoint is making sure we got connectivity on those EVIDs, you know, that they're connected to our office. So they have live information. Okay. Um, some more uh, uh, social media. Susan from Facebook, what is the distance rule at polling places for those soliciting votes as you enter the area to vote? Are these people allowed to approach voters and do mail-in ballots increase the cost to your office? I like the first question because obviously there is a there's a limit in that parking lot or wherever that you can't go past to shoot photos or do whatever. Um, and that's where the campaign signs are. But uh, sometimes you're right. There's an active person with, uh, you know, uh, a pole or something. Yeah. And it used to be 100 feet. Now it's 150 feet. We call the, you know, no fly zone or, or no bother the voter zone. And, uh, you know, where we'll get complaints is there will be campaigners outside the 150 feet. But they may talk to someone as they cross that 150 foot line saying, would you like a voter guide? You know, and there's not a uh, dome of silence. In other words, your voice can't carry across the 150 feet. It's a matter of you cannot be physically inside the 150 feet campaigning. There is the only exception inside the 150 feet is media is allowed to do exit polling, not interest pollings as you go in, but exit polling of voters as they come out and they can be within the 150 feet. Also, people will go, oh, they're doing this or that outside the 150 feet, or they've got a tent set up. My jurisdiction stops at 150 feet. What they're doing outside, if you think it's unsafe, if you think they're harassing people, it's now a law enforcement issue. It's now a JSO issue. It's not my issue. I have no jurisdiction outside the 150 feet. Well, you know, we have a call here from Tim in Clay County about security. Tim, you're on the air. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, I was just wondering, uh, how secure do you feel that the uh, local uh, voting process is? And do you feel that the 2020 uh, uh, election, presidential election, was secure or, and or fixed, sir? Thank you so much, and I think you do a great job. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I feel very good about the process we do as far as our hardware and equipment. And by that, what I mean is there's such a redundancy there's a public testing of that equipment to make sure that it's accurate in front of the public. Then it's sealed up. There's no access. You'll hear sometimes, oh, you can take that equipment and program it to do something. One, you got to have access to it. The second thing is we test that equipment to show in front of the public that it has not been altered or anything and that the votes are accurate. And then we seal it up so no one has access until it opens on Election Day. Also, there is such a redundancy of capturing the vote. There's the paper ballots that all elections can be reconstructed by counting those paper ballots. There is a thumb drive that captures those votes. There is result tapes that are printed the night of the election that are posted on the precinct wall and sent back also to audit what was actually uh, sent in and the ballots. And then in addition, when we transmit the results in to put them on the uh, website on election night, it's an encrypted virtual private network that is literally sends it in milliseconds and shuts off. But even if sometimes somebody altered that, it would have to alter the paper ballot. It would have to alter the thumb drive and the printed results before doing that. And mind you, in the state of Florida, we do a post-election audit hand count, you know, uh, randomly selected races and precincts in front of the public 
to make sure that when we hand count those, they match what was on the machine. And since doing that audit, it's been 100% accuracy. Let me go to your last question, which is, what do I think of the 2020 elections? And I've had, been asked this question many a times. You know, do I think the elections were stolen? Do I think they were honest? I cannot stand on a witness stand and raise my hand and say, yes, it was stolen or no, it wasn't stolen because I have no evidence. What I do have a concern is the lack of transparency that I saw from election officials throughout the country, covering up windows when something was done, not answering questions. All election officials should always be willing to answer any questions voters ask and propose, you know, pose to them how we do this, what is the process, show me this, and everything we should do be, should be open and transparent. That's what I saw that took away a lot of confidence in elections is that lack of transparency. You know, I have had the honor and sometimes the boredom of standing outside the glass window and watching that process get done. And it is intriguing, but it is laborious. And I even have a vague memory of watching some chads uh, be looked at way back in the day. Uh, it's um, I, I'm surprised you didn't have blind people after that squinting, squinting, squinting. And of course, that famous HBO film, some of that was done uh, in this neck of the woods. I know some people who took part. So uh, we got a black eye on that one, obviously, in the state of Florida. Um, we've got another uh, email. Uh, Michael, the role of the new state laws that require frequent renewals for mail ballots. And, you know, as you talked earlier about maybe why are there fewer requests for vote by mail ballots? Yes, uh, the Florida legislature tightened up uh, the requests. You know, when you request now a vote by mail ballot, you must give either your social last four digits, your driver's license. Uh, you must be that person or it must be for an immediate family member. Also, what also changed in Senate Bill 90 is after every federal election, you must renew your requests. In other words, right now, after this 2024 election, every request in the system will expire on December 31st. So for the 2026 election, we'll start off with zero requests and everyone must do it again. And again, you know, that was to make sure we didn't have these lingering requests or somehow a deceased voter was still on the rolls oh, that, requesting that one. one yeah. And still a ballot floating out there that could be abused or used. And, and, you know, for in case you don't know, actually, your driver's license is undergoing more security changes. As you go to renew, there's a, a numbers situation. Uh, let's take uh, Tom from NAS Jacksonville with a question. Tom, you're on the air. Oh, thank you. Uh, you were talking about mail, mail-in ballots, and I was talking to the screener. I don't. I cannot depend on my post office. I can't trust a mail-in ballot. Uh, I live on the west side. I can go four or five days without getting mail, and this is not unique. This is my whole neighborhood. I can go for four or five days and not even see a mail truck or a mail carrier in my neighborhood. And when I bring it up, when I walk into the post office and tell them that, it's met with blank stares like, so what do you want us to do about it? Here's an 800 number. Call that number to complain. You just can't count on the post office anymore to actually mail a ballot or anything else for that matter. I'm sorry to say it's really much changed. Now, I do have a question that I didn't address to the screener. If I have a legal residence in Georgia, which I do, in the national elections, can I vote in Florida and Georgia? Because Florida has no repercussity with other states. Who would know if I voted in a national election twice, once in Duval County and once in Georgia? Thank you, Tom. That is an interesting question. Yes, I'll take that one first. <laughs> one is it is illegal to vote in more than one state for the same race. And so if you're a permanent resident in the state of Florida registered to vote, this is your state to vote. Uh, you would have to uh uh, eliminate your registration here. Now, what happens is once in a while, we will get cases. Uh, I know I had one when I came into the office where someone has voted in two states, and we will turn that over to uh, either different jurisdictions. The state has an election integrity group. FBI also investigates those. Uh, but no, you're not entitled uh, to voting in, in both of those. Uh, on your first question, what was that first one, Dan? It was on the... Um, 
Boy, I, I lost it there for a second. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't vote in that one. He doesn't trust the mail. He doesn't oh, trust the mail. The mail. Yeah, let me and talk I agree because my, my poor postal guy shows up at 6 o'clock at night sometimes. Yes, yes. Uh, not trusting the mail. That's one of the re- And believe me, you're not by yourself because that's why in the state of Florida, in early voting sites, there is what's called a secure ballot intake. And there is a poll worker sitting right next to that secure ballot intake. And you can go to any early voting site. Uh, and drop that off at the early voting site, and we pick it up, and it's never handled by the United States Postal Service. So you're not the only one. We probably get somewhere around 20% of our vote by mail ballots actually dropped off to us, and those are the locations where you can drop those off. Unfortunately for some, uh, their means of voting is only vote by mail. They're, they're homebound or in nursing homes, and this is their methods, or they're out of town, or they're military uh, stationed somewhere outside our country, and they have to rely, you know, on the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, we do have some uh, assisted voting for the military that allows them to email back in their ballots, uh, not to rely on that. And also in the general election, the military ballot actually gets another 10 days uh, after the election to come in uh, for the time period. But you do have concerns that other voters have, and I can appreciate that. Uh, I definitely express Go vote. If it's one of the ways you want to vote, drop it off at an early voting site if you still want to vote by mail. Okay, so as we wrap this up, let's take the old joke and change it. Vote early. Do not vote often, right? (laughs) Yes. Jerry (laughs) Holland, Supervisor of Elections, Duval County, um, a very very familiar source for me. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, We might be talking tomorrow. You got it. Thanks, Thanks, Dan. Bye.